feminism emerged as a thread in literature, especially American literature, around the turn of the 20th century, because you started to have writers such as Kate Chopin, who is photographed here, who were writing women's stories about women's issues from a woman's point of view. Contrast this with the way that we might think of Hester Prynne in The Scarlet Letter, which was written by a man, Nathaniel Hawthorne. So was he writing truly authentic feminist literature or was he coming up with the first female hero who was the center of a modern American novel? And I think the second thing is more the answer. No matter how hard or how how hard he worked, how skilled he was, Nathaniel Hawthorne could never really put himself in the head of a woman going through those experiences. He could write sympathetically. He could write respectfully. He could do as good a job as possible, but it would be missing some element of authenticity simply because he cannot inhabit that same space. This means that the emergence of women writers talking about their own issues from their own perspective, with their own history, with their own use of language, needed to emerge as its own important thing. But we really had not had a serious theoretical study of what women were trying to do and how it applied and how we should study it for quite some time. So I'm going to give you a little background and then I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example of how we might apply this. It was until the 1970s before scientists really started to look at a feminine movement in literature and feminine methods of doing communications. Now, if we place this in American history, we are coming out of, I think, one of the high points of the American civil rights movement in the 1960s. So now we're starting to move into looking at other underrepresented groups and looking at women and the way that they communicate, but also the way that they participate in politics and in business, was actually getting rigorous scientific study as opposed to, oh, well, you know, women are like that. That kind of stereotyping is not science. Instead, we had these two sociologists, a husband and wife, Edward, uh, Edwin and Shirley Ardner, who took a look at ways that women communicate compared to the ways that men communicate and in which situations and what words did they use and how effective were they and actually applied the tools of science to this issue. It got congealed into a proper theory by a professor called Cheris Cramaray. And I think I may have mentioned in one of the previous lectures that professors and teachers are delighted when anybody takes a look at their academic work and asks questions about it, which is why we go to conferences and write papers to have somebody talk about our stuff. Well, I was actually doing a project. This was a topic in one of my courses. So I was preparing a research paper that I was going to give as a conference speech. And I wanted to make sure that I was applying this theory correctly. So I called Professor Cramaray. Um, I was teaching at FSU. She was teaching at the University of Oregon. So I allowed for the time difference. And we were able to chat for a minute about whether or not I understood her theory correctly and was using it correctly. Uh, 
I am not bashful about going up to people and asking them questions. But she was very gracious and gave me some time. We talked about my project and she said, yeah, I think you get it and I think you can use it that way. So that was very cool for me. But what she had done that was so important is she started building these phrases and outlines to give us a way to understand the communication attempts by women to be authentically heard in a society. We could use this to any other muted group because you know that when you hit the mute button on your phone, you're turning off the sound. So is it fair for groups of people because of whatever their characteristics that the larger society turns off their sound? Obviously not. But to fix that, we have to understand what is the situation? How is it that these people are trying to put their sound out there in the society? What can we do to hear them better? Those are the kinds of questions that needed to be answered. And Professor Cramaray really boiled this down into some tight ways of understanding it. One of her first things she says is here on the slide that language serves its creators better than those in other groups who have to learn the language as best they can. If any of you have ever traveled outside the United States and have had to go to a non-English speaking country, do you feel like you are at a tremendous disadvantage? So even if you go to Mexico and you speak Spanish, or even if you go to Montreal and you speak French, it's the other people's language first. They're the ones who have come up with the rules of what the words are and what slang and how you structure a sentence. Whereas those of us who have learned that language out of a textbook, maybe didn't learn the real life ways that people use it on the street. So trying to order off of a restaurant menu in Montreal or Mexico City, that can be tough. And no matter how well you did in, in college French, they can tell you're not from around here. So when you're on the inside group that's got the home country and the home language, they're on top. And the people who are visiting or have just moved here or are learning this as a second language, they're going to be fighting uphill a little bit. But it doesn't have to be about a country of origin. So we're not talking about English versus French. We're talking about communicating within the United States, all using the same English, but still having groups of people who have to fight uphill to get their ideas understood. Let me give you some examples and how that is significant. Look at this list of sexist language versus neutral language. And the list on the left is the way that society used to say things. For example, police officer instead of policeman, firefighter instead of fireman. Now, this was because there were certain jobs men ought to do and certain jobs women ought to do. And the way society made its language automatically put people into categories of being eligible or ineligible for certain kinds of careers. Now, I spent about 10 years running the fire college over in Ocala. I can tell you we had plenty of female students come through the academy program. Was that legal? Of course it was. Was it easy for them? Not necessarily. Just from a physical standpoint, men tend to be taller. Men tend to have longer arms and legs. Men tend to have thicker muscle groups. So that's just measurable science. 
However, the tools of the job don't change. We didn't have blue ladders for the boys and pink ladders for the girls. We had silver ladders that were made out of aluminum and weighed about 60 pounds. Period. The ladder itself is the ladder. So, maybe some big ex-football player who wants to go in the fire service can just pick up that ladder and throw it around. Okay. But any candidate, male or female, who happens to not be that big, can still learn how to see the center point of that ladder, how to get a shoulder underneath the rung, and get that thing balanced for an easy carry. So if you have the technique and you have the willingness to learn it, you can do the job. So now these traditionally male careers became available to everybody. So the person who delivers your mail, the person who represents you in Congress, no longer has a job title that presupposes that only men can do that job. If you take a look at the way the new phrases, the neutral phrases are built, you see how it changes from describing the person who does the job, and then it becomes the job that a person does. So a letter carrier. There's no gender involved in that. This is the person who carries letters in a Jeep to your mailbox. So the proper way to describe these things is just say, this is the job. This describes what the task or the career is. And then it doesn't matter who does it. We also had reverse examples of this. It used to be a common phrase that I would hear when my father and I were working at the hospital, that somebody would be referred to as a male nurse. Why isn't it just nurse? Well, it's because most nurses were women. So if a man went into the job of being a nurse, that was unusual. So somehow we needed to make the comment, look, here's a man in a woman's job. Today, we don't think of that. We just think of it as nurse or doctor, or dentist, or whatever it is, we talk about the job and not the person who is doing the job. So this idea of the modernness of the language really makes a difference. When we talk about, back in the days, when we talked about somebody being a policeman or a fireman, doesn't that language, if you saw that ad in the newspaper and it said, City of Daytona Beach is hiring four firemen. Would a woman think she could apply for that job? So see what I mean about the leverage and the power being with whoever writes the language. As we move forward as a society and more people get to use their own language and express their ideas, then we start seeing how not only do we get to hear these other ideas, but it opens the game up for everybody to put out their ideas and their descriptions. So this is an important thing to be able to just look at the language. So this is something that you should be trying to see when you're reading an essay or a short story or a poem. If you can tell that the writer is male or female or a member of some ethnic or, or social class, can you see that they're using language that represents who they are and where they came from? Or are they trying to use language that is open to everybody so that any reader can enjoy or understand these ideas? That's a key that you could be looking at, the use of the language when you're trying to interpret literature. And I'm going to use an example from sports to make this a little bit more fun to talk about the impact of trying to get the woman's perspective into other things. And this is the great tennis champion, Billie Jean King, who is a pioneer in women's sports, 
but also uh, a variety of women's issues. But I want to give you, in terms of the professor's theory, how we can talk about sports and not even literature to indicate these ideas, to give you some examples that maybe if you see them in action, they will stick in your head so you can use them later. So here's one of the assumptions from the professor. The different experiences caused by the division of labor result in different perceptions that women and men hold towards the world. Let me break that down. Different experiences caused by division of labor. And we just talked about that a little bit. How's a woman going to write an adventure story about a pilot whose plane goes down in the jungle if there are no female pilots? How can they relate to that job and be able to tell that adventure story? So the easy thing is to say, OK, men go out and get exciting and dangerous jobs so we can write exciting and dangerous stories by men and about men. Women, on the other hand, stay home and raise the kids so women can write exciting stories about changing babies and cooking dinners. That's not fair. That's not even sensible. But as long as certain kinds of people are being cut out of different kinds of jobs, it also changes where they see the world from. We expect that in the old days, a woman sees the world from her kitchen and a man sees the world from the top of a building that he just built. So the way that you see the city has a lot to do with where you get to stand. So the professor is saying, as more people get to do all kinds of things, then everybody gets to see the whole world and have their own ideas about it. So you get to see it from all these different angles if everybody can get out and do all these different things. Huge difference, isn't it? I'll give an example here from the state. And I just went to the FSU Florida game over the weekend. And of course, you've got a natural rivalry between the two big universities. But you may not know part of where the rivalry came from. Back in 1947 was when FSU was created. It used to be only boys could go to Florida and only girls could go to Florida State. So until 1947, if you wanted to go to law school, you had to go to Gainesville. If you wanted to go to medical school, you had to go to Gainesville. If you wanted to go to become an engineer or an architect, you had to go to Gainesville. However, if you went to Tallahassee, they taught the traditional women's careers, teacher, nurse, social worker. So I highlight for you FSCW, Florida State College for Women. That's what the school in Tallahassee was called until 1947. So you can imagine that in the 70s, when I was making uh, college decisions coming out of high school. They still talked about FSU as being the girls school because that was what it had been for quite a while. From like 1903 to 1947. Social pressure caused this. World War II is over. All the men are coming back from overseas. The new laws permit them to go to college. And there weren't enough seats in colleges, so they needed to make room for men to go to the school in Tallahassee. And to be fair, they opened up Gainesville to allow women to go there. Now the ratios are pretty close. FSU still is like 55% female, 45% 
men. But on the whole, now that FSU has a law school and FSU has a medical school and FSU has an engineering college, you could go to either place. You could be any kind of student and you could get all your professional programs. But when you are restricted that, oh, no, only this kind of people can go to that school. That keeps people from learning these different things going into these jobs. So really, this is how we get to the situation that the professor was talking about, that different kinds of labor experiences allow people different ways of thinking. So if a woman could only ever be a nurse and only men could be doctors, then not only how would you understand public health? How would you understand diseases? How would you understand injuries? How would you understand anything medical if you had to be on one side of the glass or the other? So this is an important thing to understand, that the access to education becomes the access to careers, which then becomes the access to experience and understanding. So one of the things Billie Jean King did with several other top players was they created the Women's Tennis Association. Back in 1970, women could not earn prize money for playing tennis. They still had to pay the expenses of traveling and hotels and entry fees and things to get into tournaments, but they couldn't make prize money like the men did. So they formed this association and they each took a $1 contract. Yeah, $1, like not enough to buy a bottle of pop at a machine. $1 to indicate that they were willing to take a chance on themselves to create a women's league for tennis and play their own game and try and make their own money. And Billie Jean King was really the leader of this operation. Today, we're pretty comfortable with the idea that, yeah, women play all kinds of sports. There's the WNBA, and uh, they're talking about actually adding more teams to it because women's basketball is getting really popular. So we just consider... Well, sure, there's women's pro golf, there's a uh, women's college basketball tournament, there's women's hockey in the Olympics. Yeah, they, we think of that as being pretty regular. 50 years ago, it totally was not. Now, here's where it really sinks in. Wimbledon in London is generally considered to be the most prestigious, the most important tennis tournament in the world. Players literally come from every continent to try to qualify just to play in this tournament. So in 1975, which explains why I was paying attention to this, because I was just starting to play college tennis, and um, I was paying attention to the pro tour, it turns out we had two American champions in 1975. The gentleman's singles champion was Arthur Ashe from the United States, and he made 10,000 pounds. Roughly, let's say that's $20,000, two to one exchange rate on the currency. And of course, he was significant being the first African-American man to, to win Wimbledon, and uh, he, he was a terrific gentleman sportsman and role model and significant figure in all of sports. So he was a great guy, well-deserving champion. All of that is to his credit. And Billie Jean, who we're talking about, she wins the ladies' title. And notice her prize money 7,000 pounds. 70% of what the men got was what the women's payoff was at the biggest tournament in the world. 
had to play as many matches, had competitors from as many different countries around the world. So why would women's tennis be worth 70% less than men's tennis? And she continued to fight that. And it really took until, I think, 10 years ago that Wimbledon uh, was the last tournament to finally award equal prize money to the men's and women's champions. So we see how tough that issue is. But it was men running the tournament. So maybe that had something to do with it. I'll leave you to think about that yourself. But it does mean that the muted group, in this case being the women tennis players, had to fight back against a system that they weren't running. So no, finding this unfairness and then working against it, this happens in action as well as in literature, the way that we write about it. The second assumption that Professor Kramer Ray put out says that women find it difficult to articulate their ideas as men's experiences are dominant. If men control the publishing industry, if men control the TV industry, if men control the movie industry, how easy is it going to be for women to publish their novels, produce their TV shows, and direct movies? It's going to be pretty difficult just by default. The guys know some other guys who've done these kinds of things and Okay, they give other guys these jobs. And if it's the men running all of these creative opportunities, they're looking for more war stories and more westerns and more business stories. And since women traditionally were not active in military and western and corporate things, how many women's stories? would there be? How many women would have the experience to access that knowledge and write stories or direct those movies? So this is why we kind of wind up with the women's section in a bookstore, which tends to be a bunch of romance novels because that's women's writing. And that's kind of derisive and exclusionary when you can't have women tell stories about things they're interested in because they're shut out of having these experiences. Just a little while ago, there was a documentary on History Channel, and in fact, it was talking about, if I get my cup in front of here, yes, I'm drinking out of one of my Star Trek cups today, but one of the best writers and editors on the Star Trek TV show was called D.C. Fontana. Her first name was Dorothy. But at that time, having a woman's name on a science fiction adventure story was not going to go over. So she used her initials, and they didn't realize that a woman had written this script or was producing this television show. That's just wrong. And today, we know that that's just wrong. But 50 years ago, in the United States, and one of the most modern countries in the world, it was still a hurdle that people had to get over. It was so significant that Billy Jean actually had to fight for it. Here's what happened. In 1973, there was a guy called Bobby Riggs who had been a tennis champion in the 30s and 40s. And he was making a living doing trick shot exhibitions and different promotional stuff. And he played up the idea that uh, 
any man could beat any woman at tennis, that the man was always going to be the superior athlete. And he played an exhibition match against one of the top female stars from Australia on live TV and beat her and beat her badly. And in less than an hour, and he was 20 years older than she was. So he had kind of proved his point. But Billie Jean King was not putting up with the idea that um, that that was in any way fair. So they arranged an exhibition match. This was the most people that ever had watched television on TV. The match was played in the Houston Astrodome, which was the baseball and football stadium. Because there were that many people that wanted to see it. And it had such a big TV audience that the announcer who did Monday Night Football actually was doing the tennis match. So Billie Jean's 29 years old and Bobby Riggs is 55. And she took this responsibility so seriously because if she lost, it would mean an old guy could beat a young woman. If she wins, it proves that a young woman who is in the middle of her career could beat a guy who ought to be retired. So she really didn't have a lot to win, but she had a lot to lose. Turns out she slaughtered him. But this made her suddenly the champion for all women in this big match on national TV. A couple years ago, in fact, they made a Hollywood movie about the whole thing called Battle of the Sexes, which was the title that they gave for this exhibition match. So there's a lot to this story far beyond having a, a tennis match on TV between a man and a woman. So settling this one issue that this isn't a men's sport. Now there's a chance for there to be equal attention moving towards that idea of equal prize money. Third, women have to go through a translation process when speaking in order to participate in social life. Think about if you are the first woman at the fire department and the rest of the guys at the fire station are talking about hunting and fishing and uh, working on cars or whatever they do in their spare time, the woman had better figure out how to talk about hunting and fishing and cars to fit in with the group because the dominant part of the group is not going to change what they like to talk about so that they can talk about cooking and raising kids if you want to stay in those traditional roles. So when the women are the smaller part of the group and the men are the bigger part of the group, the professor says women have to adapt what they talk about and how they say things in order to fit in with the bigger part of the group. That's not fair. That devalues what the smaller part of the group might have to say. But in the professor's research, she finds this is what's going on. This is how the thing really works. So how do we how do we deal with something like that? Well, Billie Jean had an interesting idea. She thought that instead of having men's matches and women's matches, why don't we have a kind of competition where there's equal numbers of men and women on both teams and they play against each other together? So this format called World Team Tennis, which is still going today. I actually have a friend who played for the Orlando Pro Team and uh, we keep up with each other when she goes to, to tournaments. But the idea is you'd have three women on your team and three men, and the other city would have three women and three men. And 
you would play an equal number of matches. One is men versus men. One is women versus women. One is singles, men's. The other is singles, females. And then there's also a match, one man and one woman versus a man and a woman. So totally balanced in how many people get to play for the team. All the points count the same. All the games count the same. All the prize money is equal. So in this format, which I kind of wish high schools would use, everybody gets a chance to play. Everybody gets to go out and have a fair match. And everybody gets to be represented to show what they can do. Nobody's game is worth more by weight than somebody else's. So finding these opportunities where everybody can participate, everybody can show what they can do, and everybody uh, has the same payoff at the end, much more fair. I think in common sense, we can look at that and say, yeah, everybody gets in, everybody gets a chance. And that's the way that I think it's a very much an American way of looking at things. We want to give equal opportunity. That means an equal number of seats on the bench, equal number of players on the team, equal number of games get played, equal way of counting the score. And then just whoever had a better game wins. That's fairness. To promote this, I just found this video clip from uh, here in Orlando. Uh, Billie Jean and her partner, uh, Andre Agassi, a top player, were playing an exhibition match against another top player, Pete Sampras, and Elton John. Yes, the Elton John, the pop star, because he's a big tennis fan. He actually wrote the theme song for Billie Jean's um, pro tennis team. And together, They've wound up raising through tennis millions of dollars for all kinds of charities. So over the long haul, and you see this check is from a 2012 tournament. So we go back to 1970 when those female tennis players took a $1 a year contract to have the chance to play pro tennis. Now, by working the system in the way that we've described with the professor's theory, we see they're raising $200,000 in one day to give to a charitable cause. So I think that's a lot of progress, but I don't think we would understand it as well. We would think of it just, oh, well, that's a sports story and women's tennis grew. Yeah, that's true. But using this theory that applies to women communicating in society, women being able to tell their stories and show their perspective, now we understand how that women's tennis growth really makes sense. We understand what they really had to do to make the thing happen. So I hope that that gives you some tools to understand not just women's literature, but to understand how any group kind of takes its place in a larger society and gets a chance to speak its ideas. So you could probably apply these three theoretical points to all kinds of situations. But now I think I've given you a set of screwdrivers that you can use to work on your essays in the future. Does anybody have any questions about what we've covered today? Uh, I don't think that women's tennis is going to be on any of your exams, but I do know that you're going to have some feminist writing that you will have to look at and evaluate. And maybe this will be a memory aid to help you recall what some of these um, theories are to help you really uh, compose great essays. So if anybody has any questions, raise your hand or unmute yourself. And I'll wait a moment for that.
OK, I don't see anything coming in. So as usual, I will get this video processed this afternoon and I will send you all a link through the Ingenuity email and I will also post it over in Canvas as another one of our modules so that you'll have this for reference. I think this is one of the best tools I have ever found for helping me understand feminist literature, but also to understand the literature of any minority group, any non-dominant group in any social situation. So I hope you'll find that same value in trying to apply this tool in future literature analysis. Thanks for coming. Glad to see such a good crowd today.